name is Tiffany Oliver. I serve as an advisor in the Office of Global Food Security and a Jefferson Science Fellow, a uh, professor of biology at Spelman College. And welcome to our August VAX Community of Practice webinar, this month led by Dr. Roy Steiner at Rockefeller. Um, before we get started, I'm going to uh, do an introduction from Roy, but before that, I want to turn it over to Daniela Vega uh, to do some uh, um, updates for us. Daniela, over to you. Thank you, Tiffany. And uh, I'm Daniela Vega, and I work as Chief of Staff to the Director General here in, in CIMIT, and I'm, I'm acting right now as the Executive Secretary for the VAX Partnership at, at Interim. So it is great um, to see everyone this, this morning um, here in Mexico or afternoon, depending where, where you are. Um, I just wanted to give a little bit of update on the highlights since we last met at the end of, of last month. Uh, we have been working with the co-chairs of the working groups within the community of practice to convey, I mean, they have shared the, the progress that they've made. They have worked together to update on key milestones and achievements of each of the, of each of the policy papers they are working on. And we have uh, been able to identify common challenges and areas of, of coordinations that need to be uh, enhanced um, to make sure that all of these different papers make together a nice a nice roundup for for VAX. Um, just wanted to also update that the breakout session at the Oak upcoming Borlock Dialogue here in, in Iowa in the United States, um, it, together with the World Food Price Foundation, has been secured. Um, the session will showcase the outcomes of the working papers uh, from this policy dialogue. Uh, it will be the product from this community of practice working groups, and it will serve as a platform to present these findings, the policy recommendations to a broader audience, reinforcing the importance of, of VACs. Um, as we move forward together with the organizers, more details will be, will be shared. So I'm sure that in the September um, edition, Tiffany, we're going to have more um, details to, to share. And then um, just wanted to highlight that as we continue to advance the VAX movement, um, the partnership, the CGIR CIMIT FAO partnership remains very committed to keep um, the community of practice informed, engaged. We deeply appreciate the involvement, the dedication of everyone in driving uh, VAX uh, forward and your contributions have been really, really essential and look forward to keep this, this journey together. So thank you everyone and back to you, uh, Tiffany, thank you. Thank you, Daniela. At this time, I'm going to introduce our wonderful speaker, Dr. Roy Steiner. Dr. Steiner is the Vice President for, Food Init for the Food Initiative at the Rockefeller Foundation, where he leads a team focused on creating a more nourishing, regenerative, and equitable food system. Dr. Steiner comes to the Rock Rockefeller Foundation from Amyadar Network, where he served as Director of the Intellectual Capital Team since 2015, focused on helping Amnidyar achieve its strategic objectives at all levels, including in the agricultural space. He dedicated nearly a decade of his career to leadership positions at the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation, where he was instrumental, um, a founding member actually of the Agricultural Development Initiative, and where he was instrumental in working to develop the Alliance for a Green Revolution in Africa. The creation of Ethiopia's Agricultural Transformation Agency and dozens of other partnerships which address food and security around the world. Before coming to Gates, Dr. Steiner spent eight years in Africa, where he was founder and CEO of Cyberplex Africa, one of the largest web development and knowledge management companies in Southern Africa. Early in his career, he was an original founder and manager, managing director of Africa Online, which pioneered the delivery of internet service in Zimbabwe. Additionally, he was a founding member of CH2M Hills Strategies Group and has consulted for McKinsey and Company in areas of technology innovation, growth strategies, and international development. Dr. Steiner holds a PhD and a Master's of Science in Agricultural and Biological Engineering with minors in Economics and International Development from Cornell University, as well as two degrees in mechanical engineering and biology from MIT. We, as you can tell, are very, very fortunate to get to hear from this uh, brilliant soul. And so over to you, Dr. Steiner. Thank you so much for joining us today. Great. Thank you so much, Tiffany. 
Um, so just wanted to make sure that I am actually, you're seeing the presentation mode, is that correct? Yep. Okay, yep. perfect. Uh, well, I'm so delighted to be talking about the subject. Uh, uh, school I'm sorry, Dr. Steiner, I'm sorry. Actually, we're not. We're seeing that. Uh, that oh, other you're seeing the other one. Okay. Well, sorry. I'm going to swap it then. How are we doing now? Yes, perfect. Thank you. Okay, great. Uh, well, I'm delighted to be talking about this topic, uh, school meals, diversity and resilience. Um, uh, you know, it's, it's one of those things, that I, I think there's a connection with VAX that's really quite exciting. And so I'll go into it, but let me just start off with kind of some of the things that we've been thinking about. Um, most of you on this call do not need to know uh, more about the challenges our planet is facing. Um, that you know we are we're beyond uh, getting into tipping points for nine six of the nine planetary boundaries, and so much of our food system is is the result of that. What what's interesting is how much the the climate denial uh, people are still so active. I just got an email from uh, a good friend of mine who works for. Um, a, a very smart billionaire who who thinks that the climate issue is is um, overblown or a hoax, and and just the fact that when we're seeing with our own eyes everywhere this thing, there's still this um, you know this misinformation and disinformation going on um, is is quite disheartening. I think anybody in the agriculture field knows the the things are happening, and and climate is only going to be increasingly a challenge to the future. So in order to deal with that, I think we have to do, you know, really two things. We actually do need to transform what we eat and how we produce it. We have to address both the adaptation and mitigation issues of climate. And, and that revolves around uh, that, that there are many strategies that are going to help with that. When we when we looked at what we were good at, what what could really where we could have leverage, school meals really came to the fore of it. Um, because this use of institutional procurement uh, is such an important leverage point. But more importantly, school meals are the messy of multi-sectoral interventions. I, I really like that. I mean, everybody knows Lionel Messi. Um, you know, he's an, an unbelievable football player, but he he does almost everything. He's a scorer and a sister, a runner, a team, a leader, a strategy player. Well, school meals are even better that than messy in terms of addressing so many really important development goals. We, we all know they improve the health and dietary quality of, of children, uh, the most important and most vulnerable part of our population. Um, it increases attendance, especially of girls, uh, up to 12%. Um, the economic return, when you do the true cost accounting, for every dollar you invest, you're, we're getting $9 in return from a societal point of view. So it's one of the very best investments uh, countries can make in their economic development. Um, if designed properly, it can reduce agricultural emissions and, and create farmer resilience. And, and as I mentioned before, really does reduce gender gaps by helping girls uh, stay in school. Um, and, and we know how important that is uh, for a whole variety of reasons. When it comes to climate, you know, we, we, we decided to focus on school meals because it's a, you know, school meals are the largest um, uh, part of government procurement, almost 70% of all food procured by government is school meals. Um, and that demand can be a real leverage for regeneratively grown or climate, climate smart um, schools and climate resilient um, meals. Um, so we, we that's that's one important dimension. Most people don't realize that you know all, yeah, although in the United States and other northern countries, children are a relatively small part of the population. In a place like Kenya or many other countries, um, children are twenty percent plus of uh, at least elementary school children can be twenty percent. Of the population. So when you're feeding 20% of the population, that's a significant demand lever. Um, it's also, um, you know, one of the most important ways to, to help with climate, to, to uh, with low-income families. Um, it also sets a, 
the patterns of eating. And we all know now that, you know, those patterns get set very early on. And if they get set wrong, you really predispose children to diabetes, to overweight, to um, mal malnourished brain development, uh, even past the thousand days. Obviously the thousand days are really important, but it's not like your brain, the brain stops developing. And in fact, much of the brain development happens uh, in, in, the, uh, in the junior youth uh, timeframe. Um, the other interesting thing is that how important school meals are uh, can be for reducing emissions. You know, when you're cooking for 20% of the population, that's a lot of fuel. And, um, uh, and we think that you can, uh, you, if you're shifting to more uh, clean cooking, but more even better uh, renewable energy cooking, uh, solar powered uh, cookers, uh, we can actually really move away from uh, the deforestation. And it, you know, there's one estimate that uh, one school alone requires uh, firewood of 50 hectares. Um, and, and, and that's a lot of biofuel uh, that, that, that can be avoided. Um, if you're um, cooking with, with cleaner fuels. Uh, so there's a lot of benefits and I think everybody gets it. It's one of the easiest cells, but it has actually been um, neglected. When you look at, for example, World Bank has only spends maybe $300 million on this uh, a year. Uh, uh, and, and yet the funding gap is, is pretty significant. What's interesting is from 2019 to 2022, there was a huge drop off because of COVID but when people realize, oh my gosh, school meals are so important, when, as soon as they were able to, countries brought them back up. And it was a really wake up call um, for, for the importance of school meals. Yet in, in low and middle income companies, uh, countries, um, it's really the coverage still remains really low, 19% um, uh, and now it's even lower at 18%. And there's still major funding funding gaps um, to to really reach the numbers of children that that we want. Um, so we do think that there are there's a lot of momentum in this space. Um, low income company, countries are showing a, a growing commitment. Um, the you know, most school meals are actually funded by governments themselves, and that's a really powerful way to signal to the population that the government actually cares. Um, and many populations don't think the government is there to be of assistance in any way, um, uh, uh, quite the opposite. Um, and we've got this new institutional coalition, the School Meals Coalition, that was really one of the, the, the most effective results of the, uh, the food system uh, forum uh, that, that that's, uh, the SG um, uh, started um, and in you know this school the, and the school meals coalition is uh, housed within the world food program but it's a set of I don't know how many how much you know about it but it's really um, an ecosystem of initiative we have a research consortium in the London School of Hygiene that does fundamental research we have the sustainable financing initiative that's helping how do you actually help governments fund this, and you have a data monitoring and uh, cities of feeding the future uh, initiative. And all of these are, um, are working with the, the 99 countries to help uh, move, uh, move on school meals. And there's an, an increasing number of players uh, that are, are starting to pay attention to this. It's interesting, three, three years ago, we, we, we're one of the few foundations actually at the international level focused on this. And that's, that's, that's changed in the last year or so. Um, so it is, uh, you know, a, a, as I mentioned, we are, um, there's about $4.7 billion uh, we need to fund the, the 73 million of the most vulnerable children. Overall, about $45 billion is spent on school meals at a global level. We're short this much to really reach the most vulnerable. Um, and and, and there's, a, there's a pretty significant funding gap. 
Um, so uh, we, you know, we're developing with a range of partners, something we're calling our planet friendly school meals, big bet. It's essentially how do we, what, what are the conditions we need? What are the support we need to expand school meals by a hundred million more children um, by 2030? And this is a consultation we're having with a, a whole range of players at, at the moment. Um, and the, the, the goal of this um, kind of delivery unit is, um, as we, we mentioned before, is actually provide the financial expertise and tools to create more financial sustainability, um, really helping them understand how to, to provide um, nutrient dense climate smart meals. And this is where VAX is going to be kind of critical because climate smart nutrient dense meals comes from diverse crops. And, and we need to build those linkages between growing those diverse crops and, 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 the, um, and the school meals systems that are increasing and needing more, more food. Uh, we need to make these school meals incredibly cost efficient. Um, the real challenge is that, you know, in Kenya, for example, it's 14 cents a meal. Um, uh, what can you do with such a small amount of money uh, to, to effectively feed your children? What are the options for governments? And, um, and, and, we, and, and, that's, and then how do you design a system that can actually deliver low cost, uh, climate smart, of meals. It's a real creative challenge and we think uh, we need to get the best minds and uh, around that challenge. Um, and in order to, to keep the momentum, we have to make sure that as political support, we've seen situations where the government will claim that it's uh, going to be expanding school meals and then they realize you know, there's, they have to cut other things that are uh, politically more uh, beneficial to specific members of the government and and they'll they'll retreat from that and we have to help with creating that 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 political for support and and build in the delivery agencies so that there is this momentum within within governments um and then uh, this whole you know increasing uh, you know if even if we want to create regeneratively grown or climate smart uh, foods uh, for for this, in many cases, they don't necessarily exist. We don't have the diversity we need. And this is where VAX can really help create a pipeline, a supply chain uh, that can connect directly into school meals. Um, so much of the problems of the past have been um, you know, in the agriculture is we've been very supply led. And we what the reason we really like this strategy, is that it's a demand led, build a demand, and and therefore there's a place for that supply uh, to to uh, how, get housed. Um, this is a complicated chart, um, but we think there's a whole set of engagement approaches uh, uh, that that will lead to societal impact. Um, let me move to the next. So one of the one of the examples uh, that's I think highly relevant to Vax is. You know, we're, we're working with a, a range of players. This is one example in Kenya, but it could be in many other countries where we're trying to move from, from monocropping cropping farming systems to more uh, diverse cropping systems. Um, this is, you know, how do you introduce VAX crops into uh, existing um, uh, farming systems? Well, you can't put, you can't do that if you can't create demand for those crops. Farmers are not gonna grow them. Um, and, and we have that, this example, there was the, as, as many of you know, there was the year of the millet and uh, a few years ago. And so everybody's like, let's grow millet. And in Kenya, that's exactly what they did. And then it turns out there was no market for millet and farmers got really angry. There was a real disappointment. Um, they were told there would be a market and there wasn't. And, and the people who had been promoting market uh, millet growth were scrambling you know they they called us up how, how do we do you know any places where we can sell our millet that is not a good agricultural strategy um and so you know one of the examples of how we can use school meals is um kenya has made a, 
a, a commitment and we we're still trying to figure out how to but but for example 10 percent of their ugali porridge uh maize porridge uh will become uh will, will need to be millet well suddenly you have a very significant demand driver for millet that didn't exist before and so you can create a baseline supply chain um that is very consistent that's year round um, and suddenly there's a there's a real viable reason for for farmers to be growing um, a climate resilient crop like like millet. If you don't have that, it's a much harder sell. Um, and that's what we you know we want to create. Uh, uh, this is a school in Kenya that we've been supporting um, uh, with these new menu options and um, and. They, these children will benefit from more diverse uh, crops that are are, are grown um, in a more climate uh, and resilient way. And because we can use that the future these children uh, need is one that is climate resilient. We know that there's going to be shocks um, in the future. And it, we have an ethical responsibility to create public safety nets that will ensure their future. Children and every society are the most vulnerable. So, you know, school meals are one of the most powerful public safety nets to protect the most vulnerable. In order to do that, we need to create farming systems that are not as um, susceptible to those climate climate shocks as well. I mean, too much of our, our world now relies on these uh, vast uh, monoculture fields, obviously, only some places in Africa have this, but we know that that's not a very resilient um, approach. Um, and it, and in most <laughs> cases, it damages the, the actual soil. Um, so we need to move to a more diverse cropping systems. This is a, um, a, a transformed farming system in, in the Netherlands where they've, they've gone from monoculture to growing five crops in the field, but in, in rows. And it turns out this is a much more productive system. Um, turns out that that these crops, um, their their roots reinforce each other. The, the, they, they have they produce different nutrient uh, uh, cycles and patterns, uh, uptake patterns, and they they are more resilient to pests and diseases um, because of the diversity. And obviously, every ecosystem has to figure out what is the diverse. Uh, farming system that it needs, but we do we do need to move into more diverse systems, which are more complex, which are more challenging, and uh, you know when you have diverse crops, you have diverse supply chains, and we need to figure out how to build those and create create that that demand. The other thing I want to point out, uh, and this ties into to some basic science we've been re reaching, is the, the the incredible importance of diversity. Turns out we don't know much about our food. You know, uh, you know the the the, the uh, average food composition table. You know, if you go to the USDA or the FAO, they measure up to 150 biomolecules on average, about 25. Your standard vitamins, minerals, etc. We know that the human the, the human diet now has at least twenty six thousand molecules, which means we uh, measure and understand less than one percent of the molecules that are that we eat. I mean, isn't that just shocking and surprising? When I first figured this out, I've been in food all my life. I thought we knew a lot about food. Turns out we really don't. Um, and, uh, and so, you know, when we realize this, we've, we've pulled together, um, a, a network of scientists around the world using mass spectrometry at something called the periodic table of food to start really understanding the full diversity of the molecules that we're, we're eating. And it turns out, you know, uh, it, it met hundreds, if not thousands of those molecules that we're not measuring are actually nutritionally very important. We're starting to understand the role of the microbiome and how very specific molecules feed very specific microbes, which have very specific uh, health impact. So that, that uh, so that's super interesting. So 
it's using this the the, the area of, of mass spectrometry, the the whole omics, um, and, and the periodic table of food is for the very first time creating a standardized toolkit. In the past, mass spectrometry um, has been very um, almost wild west. You send one sample to one lab, you get a very different result than the other lab because they're using different equipment, different st standards, uh, the reagents, different methodologies. We've created a global standard for the first time you can send, if, if, if a lab is using PTFI methodology, you'll get the same result. And and it, and it is, we think it's gonna be rebel, uh, chain, re revolutionary in the way we understand our food. What, let, let me just give you one quick example. You know, everybody knows you're supposed to eat green vegetables, green vegetables, right? Five servings of green vegetables. That's the standard and absolutely you need it. But not all green veggies are the same. So we did this analysis of broccoli versus spinach. Um, turns out that less than 10% of the biomolecules in each of those uh, those green veggies are the same. 90% plus of the molecules are, um, are unique to that particular vegetable. So diversity is critical. Just because you have, you're eating something green doesn't mean you're getting the same kinds of nutrients. And, um, and so I just, I, I'd never know that. And, you know, I asked actually a whole bunch of food scientists what they thought the overlap was, and almost all of them guessed 50 to 70%. Well, the vast majority of scientists have been wrong. There's a few who got it right, but um, I thought that was uh, really, really interesting. And, um, but, but even more importantly, when we're measuring our food, we are uh, tracking the metadata. Currently, if you go to the USD food composition database, they'll just have carrot not where it's grown, what variety, how it's transported, all of that. The PTFI is gonna capture for every single accession, the metadata, where it was grown, how it was grown, um, oh, you know, um, uh, the, the environment, et cetera. And I think that's going to start creating the, the large scale database we need to make some of these um, connections between health and uh, health, food, um, and what's interesting, we can use these same technologies um, for uh, uh, blood and feces, et cetera. So we can measure everything going in and everything going out and start creating connections so that maybe in five years, you'll get your blood tested. They'll know exactly what your, you know, the thousand nutritional uh, markers uh, or a hun several hundred nutritional markers probably um, and know exactly you need 200 grams of uh, broccoli and two grams of sesame seeds and da, da 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 And here's the diet that will get your health back to a balance. That's pretty exciting. So we can use this. Okay, let me, before I go into that. Uh, the other thing that's fascinating is that, you know, everybody knows we have a very concentrated uh, supply chain now. We, you know, 50, 60% of all calories come from a handful of crops. And so in, in the existing databases, we only measured 2.3% of the edible species that are available to us. We don't know what all of these other species, there's about 5,000, I think, species. Um, and so the periodic table of food is now trying to like expand that and measure more of the edible diversity that's there. So 94% of edible diversity is uncharacterized. No one's ever measured, measured it, and, which ties into this VAX is like we're, we're trying to expand and create more resilience and more diversity. Um, but we need to do that. I mean, it turns out we don't know enough or a lot about that. And so, um, uh, the Rockefeller Foundation, along with the Secretariat, SEAT, and the American Heart Association have created this global ecosystem. We have nine centers of excellence. We now have 30 national labs. Hopefully that will expand um, to, to every, every country. And it's creating going into a global public database. 
which um, really in the past, if you made it, did any food comp, any scientist was doing an analysis, they would sit on their laptop. And now um, all public research has the potential of being shared globally. So we think this is a real, this is going to be a really amazing public resource. Um, uh, and it's a resource we think will help with facts in the sense that it can start measuring that diversity um, that we need uh, if we're going to create the future food system that we want. Um, and that future food system, you know, can be abundant and nourishing and, and equitable, but we have to design it and we have to um, bring all the, the capacities to bear to, to create that. This, by the way, is an AI generated uh, uh, picture of the food system of the future. I just typed that in. I said, describe that. And I, I kind of like this diverse, uh, community centered, uh, uh, relying on renewable energy and and everybody is living an abundant life. And uh, uh, I like that vision. So with that, let me, let me stop and um, take questions. Thank you so much, Dr. Steiner. That was amazing. You already have one question in the chat um, from Joseph. Joseph would like to know more about your work with the University of the South Pacific. And then we'll uh, go to Anna's question. Okay. Well, it, the University of South Pacific is one of the centers of excellence for the periodic table of food initiative. Uh, essentially, we are have onboarded them with the the tools and reagents and and equipment. So um, they are going to be um, measuring the foods of the Pacific. This is the other thing we wanted to make sure is that this doesn't become just a global north. Um, uh, resource that in fact uh, labs and scientists in the global south can measure their own food and also choose whether to share some of that or not some of those that food especially that that's that's indigenous or spiritually important we need to build the right levels of control uh, because of a previous exploitation um, in, in many cases they those the the scientists in the global south will share that because it's it's um, valuable um, for, for everyone and, and, and can contribute to a more diverse diet. Um, what is fascinating is just how much, you know, this, this, the foods of the South Pacific are, are quite extraordinary and, um, and, and have unique characteristics uh, that, uh, you know, can be used uh, in, in their cuisine and, and shared with the rest of the world. Hope that answers that, that question for you. Everyone, feel free to um, uh, use the raise hand feature. You can also um, put your question in the chat if you prefer. Um, our next question is from Anna. Roy, thanks so much for this. It's always really interesting to to hear about the initiative. Um, I, I was particularly interested in some of the, the statistics you had on investments in school feeding. And I was curious if you had a sense of to what extent the programs that are in existence take sort of the integrated approach that you discussed of, um, you know, supplying from climate smart um, agricultural practices and using clean cooking methods, et cetera. Is that, is that sort of um, the prevailing approach uh, or, or where do you see that? No, I, I would say that's the, uh, our hope is that we actually, I mean, this is the, this idea of a, a delivery unit of kind of technical assistance that would help governments really create that system approach. I think so many school meals are really, uh, you know, th they are fall uh, often in the education department, sometimes in the agricultural department, um, and reflect the particular perspective of those government ministries, right? And uh, in many cases, they're just such a, they're like, how can we just get enough calories uh, for 14 cents, then, and that's what they're indexing on, and they're not thinking about anything else. And you can kind of understand it; it's complex. Um, we, you know, we we have a couple of countries where we've gone in and and helped them understand, um, you know, shifting. For example, moving just from refined grain to whole grain 
is extraordinary. You save 30% of the volume, you increase 90%, and it doesn't cost you anything extra, right? So can you work, find these kind of no, uh, you know, no budget implications? You know, how do you improve the quality of the food? And then, and then, and how do you attract, for example, on the clean cooking? You know, that's that's usually another department that's working on on clean cooking or renewable energy. How do you make sure that those linkages um, are are met, made? And I think that's the goal of of the the delivery unit that's that's being envisioned. Uh, that providing that technical expertise, providing best practices, uh, helping governments, you know, design these things more effectively. Thanks. Patrice, and then Gunther. Hi, Dr. Steiner. Thank you so much for this presentation. I think Anna kind of touched on my question and you touched on the answer to it, but I was wondering, what are some of the roadblocks that are preventing the integration of these more nutritious foods into school feeding programs, aside from, I guess, um, lack of uh, maybe knowledge, as you mentioned in your previous comment, um, but I guess more so like on the supply side to integrate these nutritious crops, you would have to have some type of signal um, that this program was going to ramp up or some, you know, some, some signal to farmers to grow more of this crop. So can you just touch on some of the other roadblocks to increasing nutritious crops? And then also um, maybe touch on to some of the su supply chain issues that filter into those programs? Yeah, no, it, it's, I think that's one of the critical questions. Um, to a large extent, you know, uh, these school meal programs uh, are get, are, have been, run, you know, the ones that have been running, you know, they just like everything else, like any bureaucracy, like any government program, that's, it's hard to change them. The people get used to certain ways of doing things. It's the reason why kind of this expand, when you're, you're in the process of expanding school meals and many of these countries want to expand, that's when there's a lot of opportunity to start ch changing the system. You know, for example, Kenya initially wanting to move from 1.5 million to 10 million kids. Well, where, how are you gonna procure that food that you have to develop those, those procurement standards? I think we have to encourage governments to put, diverse procurement standards in place, um, require more climate resilient, regeneratively grown foods, diverse foods in, into the school meals menu. Um, and, um, and that requires, you know, understanding a, why you're doing that or understand how that's gonna work because you know, you're changing the way the food gets cooked sometimes. Uh, you're gonna change the, the recipes uh, you have to, there, there's a whole educational process uh, that has to go with that. And, and then sourcing it, as you said, you know, it's, you, you can't suddenly have, you know, 100, 100 metric tons of millet supplied uh, easily. That's going to happen over time. So you have to step be, be not only building these school meals, but then integrating the supply chain, sending the signal, doing future contracts, all of that. So, I mean, we're, you're, you know, and if we're not thinking of that, I think vax, uh, vax initiatives are going to uh, run into, you know, are not going to grow as much as they can. But if we can integrate it with these institutional procurement, it's the first step then uh, to getting it to the larger consumer market. Uh, because uh, what's interesting is, you know, when we did this, you know, moving from uh, refined grain to whole grain and Rwandan school systems, parents were coming to um, uh, the school and saying, where can we buy this whole grain? Uh, our kids like it more because it makes them feel more fuller and it's actually quite tasty. Um, and, and so that is a way to build a market for more diverse crops because parents are, are, are watching what their kids are growing, uh, eating and and will want to potentially grow it themselves or or purchase it themselves. Um, it's a way to introduce new new crops uh, into the marketplace. Go there. Okay. Thank you, uh, Roy, for the for the presentation. 
for both actually also for the for the explanations of the periodic tables. My question is a little bit more about the school meals. You mentioned school meals mainly from the perspective of demand creation, nutrition, institutional procurement. You didn't mention school gardens. And uh, while it may be a marginal aspect, I was wondering whether in a, in a world where societies are increasingly divorced from agriculture, whether there is a space for also for cultivating uh, diversity, for learning, for children learning about the growth of diverse crops. Um, I mean, one needs infrastructure for that, but do you see a place for that or is that a very marginal area in the whole school feeding debate? School gardens and growing diversity. Yeah, uh, so I I would love every school on the planet to have school gardens. I for 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 precisely your reason. I think we are so divorced from our food. It's so important to actually um, create that connection to the land, the appreciation for what it takes, etc. Um, you know, and I and I do think that they they can be a, a a useful addition to school meals. When you do the calculation about how much of the food can be grown in a school garden, it's a relatively small percentage, right, of um, uh, of what is needed. So it's not really a a supply a major supply. It is a signal to the community. It's also a um a way to educate children so i think there's absolutely a place for it um uh, uh, uh but it's only you know we most of the food 98 percent of the food has got to be grown somewhere else and, and pulled in it's just the numbers don't don't work when you have the the other challenge that uh sometimes gets gets raised is you're you can you, it, this really needs to be a community supported event to add another burden to teachers who are already trying to teach classrooms of 50 kids. And then you're now responsible for the school garden uh, it has gotten some resistance. So the way you, you introduce these things are really important. And I think the more that they are community centered and community supported is more likely that they'll be, um, they'll, they'll last. Um, yeah, but I, I love I love them. I, I want every single school in the world to have a school garden. I think that would be a great, a long term uh, and powerful um, uh, initiative. Yeah, thank you, Dr. Steiner. That was really an amazing presentation in so many ways. Um, I'd actually like to talk, ask a little bit more about the database that you're generating, which sounds absolutely incredible, um, and the extent to which you are uh, including information about soil type and or soil health uh, for the, 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 the crops that you're evaluating. Thanks. Yeah, no, that's great. So the, the database is collecting metadata. It will be, um, at, at the very least, you'll get the, uh, obviously there, this is not universal, but the attempt is to, to indicate exactly where it was grown, which farm it's grown. And so if you have the geolocation, you should be able to then connect it to the soil type. Um, not everything, some, some of the food that's been collected is collected from supermarkets um di directly and then it's that's hard to, to 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 trace that back but we have entire data sets so you know we're working i don't know if you heard of the ecdysis foundation they're collecting data from 500 uh farms um and and uh and they they collecting 50 indicators in each of those farms uh we're taking the yields from each of those farms and doing the ptfi analysis so you'll We'll be able to do, and, and they're comparing regeneratively grown food to conventionally grown food, which is going to be a very interesting, um, uh, you know, wh where does that make a difference? Where does it not make a difference? Um, turns out, I the preliminary is there's a pretty significant difference between conventionally grown and regeneratively grown food, which is when you look, you step back, you realize, oh, a healthy soil, of course, the plant's going to be healthier. And healthier plants are more nutrient nutrient dense. It's it's not that is not a uh, 
um, in a, a big stretch. Um, but it's nice to see some of that uh, shown in, in, in uh, this, this, this high level of data. So, it, it, so and to answer your question, some of the data um, accessions will have the kind of really detailed soil analysis, others won't. We have a, you know, each project that um, different labs are doing are going to have various levels, but it's definitely the ability to, to, to capture soil data is there, whether it's done will depend on kind of what, what they're capable of. Certainly we're, what we want is we're trying to create a reference um, uh, data set that has all the omics, all the metadata, um, and we're actually talking about adding in the soil, the, the food physics um, uh, in terms of, you know, uh, there's all this, there's, there's so much more data around food that, that hasn't been connected. And I think that could be uh, super interesting, but I'm very interested in the connection of soil and nutrient density. I mean, we, there's been a lot written about it in this, and, and I think this is going to reinforce a lot of the, uh, the already, I think the knowledge that's, that's there. There is one additional question in the chat um, from Anna. I'm just going to read it. Um, it would be interesting uh, to know if there's a national program that you're familiar with that best fulfills the systems approach. Yeah, probably the the one program that uh, that often gets referenced is is the one in Brazil. So they uh, initiated universal school feeding almost 30, 40 years ago. Um, and what's interesting is that they have uh, allocated, mandated that uh, thirty percent, a minimum of thirty percent, has to be uh, locally grown, and um, and ideally agroecologically grown uh, food, and and they allow for up to thirty percent more uh, more to be paid for organically grown. Um, food. So, so it it sent it it is actually a major driver and supporter of small smallholder agriculture in Brazil, and it's created a much more vibrant and growing organic markets. So it's a great example of you're feeding this incredible diverse population uh, across, uh, uh, but you're also you're you're using that demand driver to support smallholder farmers and the transition to more agroecological systems. Nice, are there any other questions? Feel free to unmute and ask your question. If not- uh, Hi, hello, oh, yes. hi, hi, sorry. Uh, hi, my name is Brian Sobel. I'm the Associate Director for Food Production with Counterpart International. Um, I apologies. I was coming in late to this webinar. And so just thank you to all the organizers, Dr. Steiner, for uh, all the information. I hope I'll be able to get uh, access to the, the presentation. But I, I'm just curious, um, this might be a more policy oriented question, uh, but the role of USDA, particularly the McGovern Dole programs in, because uh, that focused on school feeding, currently there's a 10% cap on local and regional procurement. And sometimes it's, you know, nutrient, well, it's supposed to be nutrient dense food. Sometimes it's um, one of the opportunity crops uh, of this initiative. And sometimes it's, you know, um, more uh, preserved commodities that may have been sourced uh, out of the country. But I, I'm just Curious um, if you could talk a little bit about the role of USDA in, in helping to support the VAX initiative. Yeah, I, I think you pointed out one of the one of the most powerful ways would be to use McGovern Dole to um, create, you know, create more demand for opportunity crops. Um, we need to have these demand drivers, or else they're not going to be adopted. And Obviously, McGovern Dole is such a, a major demand driver. Um, you know, I we 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 haven't spent a lot of time on that, um, but we do think that 
that probably should be uh, uh, looked at, and and we hope that um, th there are there are people who are focused on the governed dole who can help with that and 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 create you know connect the VAX initiative uh, there. Well, if I, if I could invite you, then we're implementing McGovern Dole in Senegal right now, and and also working on mung bean um, with some great partners at Virginia Tech. So, I think a, a great opportunity to highlight uh, some of those connections. Fantastic. Any other questions? Thank you, Brian. If there are no further questions, then I just want to first thank you, Dr. Steiner, for um this wonderful uh webinar that you've led uh so i'm a geneticist as a scientist i was especially excited to hear about the use of mass spec to identify some of these unidentified and uncharacterized nutrients um amongst other things but thank you so much for leading our webinar today we will make sure that we share this with the entire community of practice and um, just as a plug for our next upcoming community practice in September, it will be led by the Alliance to End Hunger and will focus on soil quality to kind of follow That's up it. with Jeff's question. So thank you so much and great. have a great day, everybody. Okay.